very good afternoon to you all. Even after eight months, this country is still coming to terms with the historic decision to leave the EU on the 20th of June 2016. Nothing has divided the nation quite like Brexit has and continues to do so. Even John Major has joined ranks with Tony Blair, both airing their worries about triggering Article 50 and the consequences thereafter. But as Theresa May has said on several occasions, the people have spoken and Brexit means Brexit. As to whether it proves to be a hard or a soft Brexit isn't our concern this afternoon. In fact, Christadelphians don't vote on any political issues, not because we're not interested, we're probably keener than most, but because we firmly believe that God rules in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, setting up over it the basest of men. And who would have thought that Donald Trump, with no political background, would become the next president of America? But God obviously has a work for him to do in order that his will is carried out, and it could well be towards Israel that he's been elected. It has been said that prophecy is the mould into which history is poured. And we hope to see from our Bibles and recent events that all these political earthquakes are a reminder that Christ's return to set up God's kingdom is drawing nigh. So with open Bibles and open minds, we need to do a little detective work in order to establish biblical links with Britain and therefore Brexit. Now Britain as a name doesn't appear in the Bible well, things associated with this country can clearly be found when we compare it with a place called Tarshish. Now, Tarshish seems to have been a name given to places where trade and commerce took place, and which in time would, would include the British Isles. Now, it appears 24 times in the Bible, and we'll just look at a few of them now. Just open with me, please, to the book of Genesis and chapter 10. Verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons, sons born, unto, uh, born after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gom, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Ju Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rith, 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 Riphath, and to Togomar, and the sons of Javan, Elisha, and Tarshish. Kittim and Doadim, and by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. So we can just see from those group of verses that Tarshish was the great grandson of Noah, and he was of European stock inhabiting the isles. So let, let's now just turn to Jonah and to chapter 1. Verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord." Not wanting to go to preach to the Ninevites, he got on a ship to go as far away as possible from Israel. And he could only go one direction, which was westwards. Now turn with me, please, to Jeremiah and chapter 10.
And just to get the context, verse 1, Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Verse 9, Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish, and gold from you fast the work of the workmen, and so forth. But the point is, it's saying there that silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish to Israel. Well, that shows that they must have had some relationship, Tarshish, with Israel. They had some sort of friendship and were able to do trade with them in regard of silver. Now, just move on to Ezekiel chapter 27. And we read in verse 12 that Tarshish was thy merchant, this is to do with Tyre, by reason of the multitude of all kinds of riches, with silver, iron, tin and lead, they traded in thy fairs. So there was this relationship again with Tyre from Tarshish, and it was renowned for its metals. And just finally in this group of uh, uh, scriptural passages uh, Isaiah 23 that we've had by way of introduction and this is uh, to do with the overthrow of Tyre we read in verse 1 there the burden of Tyre howl ye ships of Tarshish for it is laid waste then it says in verse 3 and by great waters the seed of the seed of Sihor, the harvest of the river, is her revenue, and she is the mart of the nations. Verse 6. Pass ye over to Tarshish, howl ye inhabitants of the isle. This is your joyous city, whose in antiquity is of ancient days. Her own feet shall carry her afar off to sojourn. So in the context of Tyre being destroyed, there was classed as being the mart or the market of the nations it was to pass over to this far off place called Tarshish and again I've just highlighted these few passages we've, we've gone to just to remind ourselves that it was connected with the isles of the Gentiles that it was westwards from Israel it also traded and was a friend of Israel at some point in history that it was renowned for silver, iron, tin and lead and as we've just seen in Isaiah there that it was a far off but that it was to pass over this, um, this trade centre tyre what it was renowned for tyre was to pass over in lieu of the destruction of tyre to this place called Tarshish so what evidence, having a look at those passages there, do we have for Britain being the Tarshish in the Bible? Well, this here, this overhead of Britain and Wales, as you can see, was dotted with places that had in plentiful supply uh, tin and iron, lead and silver and so forth. And even today, you can go to places in Cornwall where they've got museums that back up this history that we've had in regard to these particular metals. In fact, um, uh, the name Britannia is a Celtic name and it signifies the land of metals. There we have just one of the um, dilapidated... Um, um, places for the procuring of, of tin that you can still find in parts of, of Cornwall today and here we have in the Royal Cornwall Museum a, a tin ingot some of them were quite heavy in weight um, but one of the unique attributes of tin is that it doesn't rust which when we think of our particular climate that's very useful but when we have 10% of tin mixed with 90% of copper, it produces bronze, which was very useful for weaponry in the time of the Bronze Age, and were also for making other commodities with these metals. 
Now, archaeologist Adam Sharp says that every piece of bronze in Western Europe had Cornish tin in it. Therefore, Cornwall becomes pivotal in the Bronze Age. In fact, if you were to take away the contribution of tin from Britain, you wouldn't probably have even had the Bronze Age because so much of it came from this country. The Phoenicians' trade with the coast of Cornwall was especially for the procuring of tin. Of all the metals, tin is found in the fewest places, and though Spain seems to have had yielded some anciently, yet it can only have been in small quantities. While there was an enormous demand for tin in all parts of the old world, since bronze was the material almost universally employed for arms, tools, implements and utensils of all kinds. From the time that the Phoenicians discovered the tin islands, the, the Cassiterides, as they call them, it is possible that the tin of the civilised world was almost wholly derived from this quarter. Another quote here far by Rawlinson. But the great and only reliable tin mart of the world in the Bronze Ages was England, especially its southwestern extremity, now known as Devon and Cornwall, on the islands of the Channel, the first recorded name of which is a Greek one signifying tin isles, the Cassiterides. When or in what way the Phoenicians ever heard of so remote a nook, so totally out off the beat and beyond the horizon of all nations, then of, then of any note, must ever remain a mystery. The knowledge of the sea route to the tin islands, the Phoenicians kept strictly to themselves and were jealously watchful that no one should follow and supplant them there as the Greeks had supplanted them near a home. According to McGraw-Hill in his book World History, he says the Phoenicians used the pole star for their observations and are said to have circumnavigated Africa and to have reached as far north as Cornwall in search of lead and tin just in case we're not quite sure where Tyre is. It is that, if you think of Israel being below, this is basically southern Lebanon as we have it today. Just on that map on the overhead there, in the red, you can see how it circumnavigated Africa, the Phoenicians, and also going up to Britain there. And that's a typical ship that was used for... Uh, delivering of trade to these various places in the Mediterra Mediterranean and beyond. And here we have um, a mix of people, the Phoenicians, with those in, in Britain, and we can see there's an exchange being made for these tin ingots with other precious materials that the Phoenicians brought and you have that purple dyed cloth there which is being held aloft and the Phoenicians whose name means purple merchants were famous for their dyed cloth known as Tyrian purple. The dye was obtained from the shellfish Murex tranquillus and it took 60,000 seashells to produce just one pound of dye so it was very expensive. And the dyers used tin and lead for the process as other metals would discolour the essence. And Barbara Tuckman in her book The Bible and Sword says the pre-Bronze Age shell dumps of the particular kind yielding the purple dye was found on the Cornwall and De Devon coasts. Here's a quote regarding Ezra Hayden. All the kings from the lands surrounded by sea, from the country Ladanana, Cyprus and Laman, Ionian islands, as far as Tarshish, bowed to my feet. And as we've got highlighted in there, red, Tarshish is a place that was surrounded by sea. And, and again, surely that points the finger towards Britain. So we can see there's a definite link there between Britain or Tarshish and Tyre. 
because of the valued metals that this country had above all, above and beyond all others. In fact, King Hiram of Tyre had a contract with King Solomon to supply all the necessary materials for Solomon's temple. And it's more than likely that the bronze, or the tin for the bronze, would have come from Britain. Um, in fact, the laver, or basin for washing, was thought to weigh about 20 tonnes. So an awful lot of this metal was necessary. Now we read from Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 23, that Tyre would be destroyed and pass over to Tarshish. And we have historical evidence of it. Oh, there's just one more quote here, just emphasising the link with Britain. Of that part of Europe nearest to the west, I'm not able to speak with decision. I by no means believe that the barbarians give the name of Iridaeus to a river which empties itself into the northern sea, whence, as it is said, our amber comes. Neither am I better acquainted with the islands called the Cassiterides, from which we are said to have our tin. It is nevertheless certain that both our tin and our amber are brought from these extreme regions. So although he's admitting his ignorance on certain things, he's convinced of one thing, that it comes from an extreme region, this tin that was necessary. Here, bearing in mind the location of Tyre, near Israel, we've got there um, a causeway that Alexander the Great built in order to get to this island of Tyre that was just off the coast there in order to lay siege and destroy it in July of 332 BC. And it, it ceased to be a trading place and the mart of the nations from that day forward. Interestingly, the word Tyre means rock. And so we, as we can see that Tyre was built on a rock here, but then flattened by Alexander the Great. Now we know from history that the characteristics of Tyre was to migrate first to places around the Mediterranean, such as Alexandria, Venice, Lisbon, etc., but then finally settle in Britain. There's a slide I've missed out there, but don't worry. That overhead there is just an illustration of all the many seafaring groups from the British Isles all around the four quarters of, of the earth. And we think of the likes of Captain Cook. There was hardly a place that he didn't um, find and put the imprint of the British Empire uh, and made strong links with them. And of course, now we have the British Empire. But when we think that there was one point in British history when it was said that the sun never set on, on the, the empire, it covered a quarter of the Earth's landmass and held sway over a fifth of the world's population. So much so that even that well-known song was um, coined, Rule Britannia rules the waves, to thee belongs the rural reign, thy city shall with commerce shine. All thine shall be the subject main, and every shore it circles thine, and so forth. That was the arrogance to which this country had in regard of the dominance it had over so many countries because of the trade links that they had. Britain, if you like, had a monopoly of global trade. Um, and again, when you think of the city of London, it's now the global... Um, financial capital as we have in that picture there of the uh, Bank of England and as we read earlier in, in um, Isaiah, Tyre was known as the mart of the nations and this particular baton has been passed on to London now the city of London is still the one centre in the world possessing the skills and services to handle the commerce of the world as Tyre of old did and the British Mercantile Navy is, is, Navy is still the chief carrier of other nations' goods, as were the ancient ships of Tarshish. The Baltic and Mercantile Shipping Exchange is still, by common consent, the greatest shipping freight market in the world. 
Almost every ship owner in the world is represented here. London has become the centre of the world's foreign exchange market for the exchange of one national currency into another. When we think of Lloyd's of London, founded in 1688, it's the world's specialist insurance market, providing insurance cover uh, in over 200 countries, banking facilities, exchange control freight arrangements, either by sea or air, and insurance of all these requirements are brought into focus in the city of London. So there are strong links between the spirit of Tyre that came to be settled in this far off place called Tarshish, which has moved, as I say, at different periods to eventually settle into these islands. And, and we can see already that tin almost exclusively came from Britain, such was the demand for it for the Bronze Age, which produced so many things relating to that metal, hence the name. So if we can be comfortable that there's so much pointing towards Britain in regard of Tarshish and Tyre, we, we want to just think a bit about Brexit from a, from a biblical point of view. But let's just take our minds back to 1957 and the Treaty of Rome. This was a historic moment when just six countries at that particular time, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, Italy and Germany, were the only members compared to the 28 at present. And then we have the, the Treaty of Rome for which um, Britain joined itself to here in 1973. Edward Heath cements Britain's membership with um, Europe some 16 years later. So at this time we've committed ourselves, which to begin with we weren't welcome into the common market it was. I can still remember as a, a young lad, uh, General de Gaulle, it was no, no, no. He just didn't want us to come in. But we were determined to go in and so we committed ourselves to this. And so it was, after a number of years in Europe, a certain is case of cometh the hour, cometh the man. And Nigel Farage suddenly comes onto the scene and his, he was to spend 20 years campaigning to take Britain out of Europe. And his sort of logo was, logo was I want my country back. And now he's achieved his ultimate political ambition, seemingly against all the odds. But this is interesting. As a career, he spent his time as a city commodities trader at the London Metal Exchange. How ironic that is. But all this might have fallen at the first hurdle when he could so easily have died in a plane crash just seven years ago and I do remember that being reported on the news but he survived to do what we now know to be bringing us out of Europe quite remarkable we move the uh, clock forwards to uh, June the 23rd 2016 and of course the unexpected happened Bearing in mind that David Cameron had called for a referendum after winning a majority at the general election 12 months earlier. All the experts at that time, including Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, the IMF, President Barack Obama, were all singing from the same hymn sheet, don't leave, if you do so it will be utter disaster. But things took a decidedly unexpected turn that was completely out of human control. Summer storms almost always hit Britain from the Atlantic in the west, but eerily, the huge storm smashing the country today swept in almost precisely at midnight from the direction of Brussels. That coincided with the very date that Britain was going to have this referendum and again, we've got an aerial photograph of what happened on that particular occasion. Lightning strikes Parliament on Brexit night. And 
Again, there was a night like no other. There was so much frantic activity among the electorate, even in the sky above. But it didn't end there. There was massive thunderstorms from Europe smashing into the UK and could decide the EU referendum vote, says the Daily Express. One report described it as being on biblical proportions. What a, a telling comment by those in the press but how right they were. There was a price to pay for being on the losing side because David Cameron had thrown all his eggs into one basket and now his position was untenable. A couple of days later, he announces his resignation. resignation. Brexit earthquake is described here in the Times. And, and what an amazing turnaround being the Prime Minister now, currently, is not even an MP. You just couldn't write it, could you? And on top of that, we have an unelected Prime Minister in Theresa May who has been cap catapulted into the hot seat. But like the, a previous woman in number 10, she isn't for turning. So let's now go to the Bible and look at why Christadelphians have always believed that one day Britain would separate itself from Europe. And the passage that we're going to consider is a latter-day prophecy which speaks of an invasion of the land of Israel. So if you'll turn with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 38. And we read in verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. But this we believe to be speaking of modern-day Russia, as in fact do a lot of the churches. And it says in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia and Libya is with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Persia, of course, is the old name for modern day Iran. Ethiopia and Libya are names we're all familiar with. And then there's those more unfamiliar ones we have in verse 6 there. Goma and all his bands of the house of Tagama of the north quarters and all his bands with many people with thee. Again, we haven't got time to dig into the historical records to show how these ancient named places fit into this slide we've got before us. But again, you can see the approximate location of these names that we've just read of in this particular chapter. And quite fittingly, we've got Tarshish uh, highlighted there as well. But basically, you've got all of Western Europe and countries in the Middle East and Russia coming down onto Israel. And just to make our identification even more um, secure, we read in verse 15 of this chapter, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And if you were to look in the, the revised version of the Bible, it says the uttermost parts of the north. And if you were to go due north from Jerusalem, you would hit Moscow, the capital of Russia. So even if we get a bit confused with the names that we can't always identify, it's still done to alter the fact if you go due north from Jerusalem, once you've hit Russia and, and Moscow, there's nothing beyond there. And this is where this power is going to come from. Now we're also given what the, um, the context is of this chapter. Look at verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely all of them so 
it's coming this invasion upon the mountains of Israel not Palestine it's still called Israel which again if you go back far enough in time it wasn't called Israel it shows you how up to date the Bible is again you'd only have to look at an old fashioned Bible say from the 19th century and Israel didn't exist then but you turn the clock back to 1948 and we can see that now they're an entity in the land and they're in every school atlas. Israel as is a country exists and this is the invasion that's going to come upon this particular area. Now we're told what the motives are. You know, many a time we have things in the world going on and we think, why have they gone into that country? Why is that person being assassinated? Why has this happened? Well, we're given the motive. If you look at verse 12, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Now many Bible students pondered over what the great spoil would be in a country no bigger than Wales. We now know what that spoil is because in the last 10 years, Israel has discovered en enormous deposits of gas and oil so much so one of them is called Leviathan just to emphasise the sheer size and the magnitude of these things and as it says at the bottom there the US Geological Survey estimates a mean of 1.7 million barrels of recoverable oil and a mean of 122 trillion cubic feet of recover recoverable gas in the Levantine, Levantine Basin province of course, with all these statistics, they're forever changing, but I think in this case, it's always on the increase. So, again, we now know what the spoil is that would prompt such an invasion against the people who are at rest. And because of this invasion, it provokes a response from the merchants of Tarshish. So, here, in a prophecy that yet hasn't happened, we've still got the ships of Tarshish, they still exist. Well, if it isn't Britain, who is it? So it's a name that's still current, as we see in our Bibles. And what's more, it's still trading uh, as merchants. So we can, with some confidence, say that this is speaking of the UK. And it also <laughs> mentions there Sheba and Didan. Now, historically, these places can be f found alongside Saudi Arabia and Today it's better known as the. Um, that's out of order. Oh well. <laughs> I did have a map showing um, where uh, Sheba and Dedan was, but it's just basically where you got Israel there. It's to the right and further down. Now it also spoke in that verse of the young lions. And again, how appropriate that we have this particular overhead. The empire needs men, and Britain depicted as an old lion, and then helped by the young lions. And again, lions are something which is symbolic of this particular country. And the young lions really have been referred to here are countries that were part of the British Empire, but now are classed, I suppose, as Commonwealth countries. They're independent. They look after themselves, but they still see Britain. There's obviously close links with Britain, as we can see. But the question is asked, art thou come to take a spoil? Now, for someone to say, art thou come, suggests that there's a, a British presence in Israel, which could be down to trade or political reasons. But either way, there's definitely a presence of Britain in some capacity by the fact that it could ask this particular question. So she must be friends with Israel, which seems to be an ongoing thing, and particularly with Theresa May. She certainly wasted no time in meeting up with the likes of Benjamin Netanyahu and so forth. 
Um, and so, and that is one of the major arguments from those scriptures in Ezekiel for Britain's Brexit from the EU, though she, so that she can fight on the side of God's people, Israel, and against her former allies. If Britain remained in Europe, we would be with France and Germany and all these other countries and would go as maybe UN uh, peace-seeking group under the banner of Europe with Russia against Israel but we're not we're actually opposing them so it shows that there must have been something that would bring them apart and we've seen that last year now Britain has already been identified in the pages of scripture by John Thomas the founder of the Christadelphians who was convinced of a prophecy in the uh, in Isaiah chapter 18 which we'll not look at now that Britain would be instrumental in the return of the Jews <laughs> to Israel this is what he had to say in 1848 I know not whether the men who were at present contrived the foreign policy of Britain entertain the idea of assuming the sovereignty of the holy land and of promoting its colonization by the Jews their present intentions however are of no importance one way or of the other because they will be compelled by events soon to happen to do what under existing circumstances heaven and earth combined could not move them to attempt. The finger of God has indicated a course to be pursued by Britain which cannot be evaded and which her counsellors will not only be willing but eager to adopt when the crisis comes upon them. Now this could never have happened had the Bible not taken root in this country. You think of the King James Bible and the centuries that the Bible has been circulated in these lands to the point where instead of having pubs on every corner, there was churches on every corner. Children went to Sunday school. So the climate was right for British politicians to do what John Ta Thomas anticipated from Scripture. Now, this gentleman here, he died in 1871, John Thomas, and never witnessed the political decision of the British Foreign Office some 46 years later. But we know it better as the Balfour Declaration, where His Majesty's Government view we favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Now there's no way John Thomas or any other person could make such a bold prediction unless it was already there in the Bible waiting for someone to see it and to read it and to understand its meaning. You can't just pluck out things like that. Now, one final Bible passage which is very compelling can be found in Psalm 72, which is a messianic psalm. Psalm 72, a psalm for Solomon. <clears throat> Verse 1, give the king thy judgment, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. Verse 7, in his day shall the righteous flourish, and abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Verse 10, the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Dedan, uh, so the kings of Sheba and Seba shall, shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So not only is this a wonderful picture of a world where wickedness is replaced by righteousness and ultimately peace... What is of interest is that it speaks there in verse 10. It talks about the kings of Tarshish and of the Isles shall bring presents. 
And what it's telling us is that Tarshish still has a monarchy and also that it's on an island. And we believe the latter-day Tarshish to be Britain, which inhabits Isles, which, has, which inhabits the Isles of Britain and has a reigning monarch. And I've got this overhead here, and it's highlighting places that used to have monarchies and are now abolished. But in blue and red, we have, in the red, uh, pl places where they still have quite a lot of influence, um, such as in Saudi Arabia and Morocco. But when we look at the blue on the map, where we still have, um, a, 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 what's the name, a, a, um, the, um, a, a kingdom, as it were, we've got Britain, and as far as I can see, it's the only place in the world that's an island that has um, a kingdom, um, what, you know, place where we've got royalty. I don't know of any other place on the earth where it's an island that has um, such a thing as a kingdom. And so, again, I think that rather narrows it down to it being Britain. But with all that we've seen in regard of London and the position that plays in regard of trade worldwide, as it did before in Tyre, and then the fact that you, Britain seemed to be unique for what it could provide in, in tin and lead and iron and silver, everything is pointing towards Britain. And the very fact that in the time of John Thomas, he anticipated, although he didn't know what it was going to be, the Balfour Declaration. And as far as I'm concerned, if something looks like an elephant and sounds like an elephant, it usually is an elephant. And it's a case of, it's, it's like this. If it's not Britain, who else fits all this criteria in regard of the tin, an island, a monarchy? I think it only really points to this country. So in conclusion, we can see that Britain and Brexit is very much a part of God's unfolding purpose. And we wait in anticipation for Christ's return when those who have believed in the gospel and obeyed its command to be baptised and follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ can enjoy the kingdom of God in a glorified earth. Music